today at the Miskatonic University. We will be discussing the life, the mysterious escapades, and infamous death, or deaths according to differing legends, of an enigmatic figure of the Russian high society in the early 1900s. The Mad Monk. The Dark Force. Grigory Yefimovich Rasputin. Born in a small village by the name of Prokovskye, near Tiamen, in Siberia, in January 1869, Grigory was the only one of seven children of a peasant woman named Anna Parashokovia to live beyond adolescence. From an early age, he was said to have had visions of God in the future as well as having angels appear to him, giving him insight into things he should not have known. Some villagers said that he could heal wounded and sick animals just by laying his hands upon them and his powers came from God, while others believed that he was possessed and his abilities came from a satanic origin. When Gregory was just eight years old, his brother of twelve years fell into a river and died of pneumonia. He took his brother's death deeply to heart, and in his teen years he started to drink heavily, and was becoming known for his foul moods and erratic behaviors. All the while still practicing his seemingly magical abilities, and in 1889 he met and married a woman of the village named Praskovia Dubrovina, and had three children with her. Marriage, however, was not in Gregory's nature, and he would not stay loyal to his wife. She, interestingly, accepted this and said, My husband is man enough for more than one woman. As time went on, his antics got worse, and by 1897, in a drunken fit, he had stolen a horse from a neighbor. The villagers, enraged, had enough of his debaucherous behavior and attempted to banish him from the village. He instead convinced them to allow him to come back after traveling to the Holy Zinominsky Monastery to repent for and change his wicked ways. He walked 140 miles to the monastery and there he met a priest named Makari, who was, at the time, one of Russia's most notable wise men. Makari took notice of Gregory and told him to wander the forests to hone his abilities and teach the gospel to whoever he met. It was in his travels that he came into contact with the Christi, a mysterious cult and offshoot of a Christian sect who believed the only way to true salvation was to first sin heavily, then repent in the most extreme of ways. Gregory joined the cult and practiced their beliefs involving nearly killing one another by asphyxiation and having large blind orgies as well as possibly practicing occult rituals, then flogging and beating one another to repent. They would even shackle themselves and wander the forests wearing nothing to protect them from the cold in atonement. They were not allowed to shower, and this is the origin of Gregory's disheveled looks and odorous aura. Upon Gregory's return to his village, the people had noticed he was a completely different man. He would stare out into nothingness in complete silence, and when he did speak, it would be in an erratic and often nonsensical way. A few days after his return, however, he awoke one morning saying he had been visited by the Virgin Mary who told him he must immediately travel to St. Petersburg to assist the royal family. It was then in 1905 that he traveled to St. Petersburg and met with his old friend and mentor Makari, who brought him to the meetings of the Russian High Society. There he was introduced to the Tsar and Tsarina through the Crow sisters, formerly known as Princess Melika and Anastasia of Montenegro, who witnessed his abilities firsthand and thought he would be a perfect replacement for the Tsarina's former spiritual advisor, who claimed on his deathbed that the Tsarina would soon meet a holy man who would replace him. 
The Tsar and Tsarina were unsure but intrigued by Gregory and his nonchalant and informal behavior. However, their doubts completely disappeared when he frantically came to the palace and demanded to see their only son, Alexei, who secretly suffered from hemophilia. Unbeknownst to anybody but the royal family, Alexei had fallen and was in great pain. Gregory had said he had a vision from God telling him to heal the boy, and if he could not see him, the boy would die. The Tsarina allowed Gregory into the boy's chamber, and he told the doctors to stop administering to the boy so he could heal him himself. Almost immediately, Alexei was feeling better and could rest, to the astonishment of the Tsar and Tsarina. Gregory had then and there firmly cemented himself as the Tsarina's new spiritual advisor. From this point forward, Gregory would only refer to the Tsar and Tsarina as Papa and Mama, respectively, as though he was one of their own, and in a matter of months he was making weekly trips to the royal palace. Gregory would pray with the princesses and tell them bedtime stories at night. He began giving drugs like opium and morphine and even cocaine to the Tsar, claiming it would help his various ailments and he would spend time speaking with the Tsarina, healing her of frequent headaches and anxiety. Quickly he gained the trust of the royal family, however, the Russian courts and others of high repute did not like the fact that a disheveled-looking and sporadic-behaving peasant was infiltrating their neatly groomed and well-to-do ranks. Even members of the Russian Orthodox Church, who once welcomed Gregory, were displeased by his behavior. Gregory was given an apartment in the working-class housings of St. Petersburg, where he started hosting parties that grew more and more debaucherous as time went on. He would host mostly large groups of women who were infatuated with him. He would also conduct private meetings where he would tell the women that he could only heal them through sexual interactions or beating the sin out of them. One woman, by the name of Olga Loktina, believed Gregory was the second coming of Christ, and she even left her husband and children to live with him despite knowing of his debaucherous acts with other women. In fact, she encouraged it. After hearing of these devious acts carried out by Gregory, a bishop by the name of Hermogen and a high-level priest named Iliador confronted him and beat him mercilessly with a large crucifix telling him that his powers came from the devil and that he was no holy man. After this, Gregory went to the Tsarina and told her what the clergyman had done. The Tsarina banished the two men from Russia forever. After the attack, the Tsarina put Gregory on 24-hour protection. It is here, through written records of the police who were on guard, that we get the first glimpses into Gregory's personal struggle between good and evil. October 11th, Rasputin came home dead drunk at 1 a.m. and assaulted the concierge's wife. October 12th, 10 p.m., a woman whose identity was not determined left abruptly and slammed the apartment door. Rasputin opened it and laughed and slammed it again. Rasputin came home dead drunk at 7 a.m., smashed the pane of glass in the door. Sent for a masseuse, but she refused to come. Sent for a seamstress who came instead. October 20th, 2 a.m. Walking home after two hours in bathhouse with prostitute, Rasputin is shouting at himself about war for his soul between the devil and Christ. After a few weeks, Gregory went back to his village and family, hoping in his childhood home he could recuperate from his spiritual struggles. On the very day that Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, coincidentally an assassination attempt was made on Gregory's life as well. An ex-prostitute named Kihonia Guseva, who was horribly disfigured, missing her entire nose after an attack by a few of her former clients, was hired to assassinate Gregory by the priest Iliador. 
He had told her how Gregory would beat women and be unfaithful to his wife. She waited outside Gregory's house in the early hours of the morning. Gregory had to send a letter off to the post office, and when he left his house, she followed him. Upon his return journey, she jumped out in front of him and stabbed him in the stomach over and over. She was so committed to killing him that she dug her hands into his stomach and pulled out his intestines. She ran off before anyone could catch her. Miraculously, Gregory survived but would never fully recover from this attack. While he lay in his hospital bed, he frantically wrote letters to the Tsar and Tsarina pleading with them to not go to war, writing to the Tsar, Dear friend, I will say again a menacing cloud is over Russia, lots of sorrow and grief. It is dark, and there is no lighting to be seen. A sea of tears, immeasurable. And as to the blood, what can I say? There are no words, the horror, it is indescribable. They will conquer Germany. And what about Russia? If one thinks verily, there has not been a greater sufferer since the beginning of time. She is all drowned in blood. Terrible is the destruction, and without end the grief. The Russian Tsar, you will be killed by the Russian people, and the people will be cursed and serve as the devil's weapons, killing each other everywhere. They will destroy the Russian people and the Orthodox faith, and the Russian land will die. Gregory Rasputin His letter to the Tsarina went as follows. I shall be killed. I am no longer among the living. If you hear the sound of the bell which tells you that Gregory has been killed, you must know this. If it was your relations who have brought my death, then none of your children will remain alive for more than two years. And if they do, they will beg for death as they will see the defeat of Russia, see the Antichrist coming, plague poverty, destroy churches, and desecrated sanctuaries where everyone is dead. Pray, pray, and be strong, and think of your blessed family. Gregory Rasputin the Tsar did not listen to Gregory's pleas and went to the front himself to lead the Russian armies against Germany. With the Tsarina alone in the palace, Gregory recovered and went back to St. Petersburg to continue to advise her. There are many rumors that in this time Gregory and the Tsarina had an affair, but an examination and comparison between the private letters of Gregory and the Tsarina and the private letters between the Tsar and Tsarina prove that she spoke to Gregory with adoration and respect, but she spoke to her husband with love and loyalty. They most likely did not have an affair, however, Gregory was unofficially acting as Tsar by proxy through the Tsarina while the Tsar was on the front. By this time, the nephew of the Tsarina, Prince Felix Yusupov, who despised Gregory from the very beginning, had been planning a plot against him involving the Tsarina's cousin, Grand Duke Dmitri Pavlovich. Felix had planned to use his wife to lure Gregory to the home, saying she had a sex addiction and needed his counsel. And when he would arrive, they would poison him with cakes and wine laced with cyanide. There is also evidence that possibly proves that the British Secret Service was involved in this plot as well, through a man named Oswald Rayner, who worked for the British Secret Service and was an old university friend of Felix. On the night of December 30th, 1916, Felix invited Gregory to his home and brought him to a room under the first floor that they had made to look like there was a party before Gregory arrived. There were sweet cakes and wine, all laced with cyanide. Gregory, being a man of great appetites, ate a large amount of the cakes and even demanded more wine after drinking all that was there. 
Felix was holding back his astonishment and fear, trying to keep a level head as to not arise suspicion from his victim. When Felix went back upstairs, acting as though he was getting more wine for Gregory, he had told the Grand Duke that even though Gregory had ingested enough cyanide to kill twenty men, he was still alive with no notable signs of delirium. The men contemplated on what to do when Felix grabbed his gun from his desk and proceeded to go back downstairs and shoot Gregory in the stomach. After a small struggle, Gregory fell to the ground motionless. Felix, confident he had killed his victim, went back upstairs to explain the deed was done. He and his co-conspirators toasted to the death of their enemy, but in the back of Felix's head, a growing feeling of dread ensued. He went back downstairs to check the body to make sure Gregory was truly dead. When he entered the room, Gregory was still lying on the floor, but as Felix went to inspect the body, Gregory's eyes opened and he lunged up at Felix, yelling at him. Then Gregory quickly fumbled his way up the stairs, and just before he reached the door to freedom, he was shot in the lower back by the Archduke. Gregory fell to the ground, and this time they believed he was surely dead. They wrapped his body in a carpet and drug him across the courtyard to a car driven by Rayner. But just before they reached the vehicle, Gregory awoke and again started thrashing and moaning from inside the rug, forcing his way back out. However, Rayner jumped out of the car and, using his weebly revolver, shot Gregory perfectly square in the middle of his forehead. They wrapped him back up and put his body in the car. They then drove to the Bolshoi Petrovsky Bridge and threw his body, still wrapped in the carpet, into the Nevia River. His body was found three days later, unwrapped and frozen in a position suggesting he was clawing at the ice above him, trying to break free. There was a letter sent from the secret headquarters of the British Secret Service in St. Petersburg that read as follows. Although matters here have not proceeded entirely to plan, our objective has clearly been achieved. Reaction to the demise of dark forces has been well received by all. Rainer is attending to loose ends and will no doubt brief you on your return. All but confirming the suspicion that the British Secret Service was somewhat involved in the assassination. Gregory was buried on January 2nd, 1917, at a small church at Tarkovskoye Selo, near St. Petersburg. The small funeral was attended only by the royal family. Gregory's predictions of the death of the royal family and the fall of Tsarist Russia all came true, and after their deaths, a detachment of soldiers from the revolution exhumed castrated then burnt his body to keep his grave from becoming a place of pilgrimage for his followers. This marks the official end of Grigory Yefimovich Rasputin. However, there are rumors that Rasputin's spirit lived on through dark occult practices, his soul being taken by the evil that had tried to sway him in his living days. It is said that Rasputin's followers conducted ritualistic sacrifices to bring back their master, and in doing so led his spirit to hell where he became imbued with the powers of the great red dragon from the Book of Revelations. This dragon was known to the Sumerians and possibly an even earlier civilization as the Ugdru Jahad, a large god of gods whose serpent-like tentacles could wrap around our entire universe. Legend states that he was resurrected by a group of his followers and his spirit possessed a body they had prepared for him. He told them that every time he died he would cross over and more of the dragon would come back with him when he would return. Supposedly, Rasputin had been contacted by the Nazis to help win World War II with occult magic and in 1944 they attempted to bring the Agdru Jahad's full form into our realm.
believing it would create a new Eden for the Aryan race. They failed, and Rasputin supposedly died again that night, being sucked into a wormhole created by a machine made by the Nazi scientists. However, some blind members of his cult say that Rasputin visited them in a form of a floating specter that they could see. They said he was thin and pale, and his eyes were black. His wounds from his life were dripping with blue flame, and he instructed them on things only known to them. These are the last mentions of Rasputin. This larger-than-life figure of mysterious repute has been a great source of contention for the Russian people and the high societies of Russia's well-to-do. He once held the greatest power in Russia, but in the end, his prophecies came true, and according to legend, his dark spirit lives on in the shadows of the veil between our realm and the next. To end on a lighter note, we have an early letter from Gregory before his dark days to the Tsar, explaining why Russia should not go to war with Germany. The letter reads as follows. War is not a good thing, but Christians run straight towards it. We Russians should avoid war, and we should build a monument, a real monument, I say, to those who work out peace. Grigory Ifimovich Rasputin.